Um, it is a great pleasure to welcome the panel to the stage, but I'll introduce Emily and then allow her to introduce everybody who's on the stage. Um, you will, of course, be aware of the fabulous work of Emily Salkeld, formerly of South Australia, but South Australia's loss is Victoria's gain, absolutely. It's absolutely fabulous to welcome you to the stage, Emily. Please come on over. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. OK, we've, we've assembled the array of extremely diverse millers up here. I'm going to go through and ask them, each, each of them, um, what their mill is and how it uh, actually processes the grain into flour. But first, I'll introduce Ian, who is right here, Ian Congdon. Uh, he and Courtney Young uh, have a property, 100 acres, up at Rother Glen, um, and they're closely connected to Ian's folks who are just over the border at Berrigan. Um, they produce their own grain, uh, a few different types of grain, including wheat and rye. Um, have you still got Corazan going? Uh, just a little bit. Just a little we're bit, yeah. We usually don't talk about Corazan when we're talking millers, because it's just damn hard to grow, damn hard to get. Anyway. Um, Ian and Courtney own and run a um, new American stone mill and um, they've really built their business around um, fresh flour that's um, based on a, a whole grain product and they've recently been um, recipients of sustainable table funding um, to diversify their business into um, a sifted flour product as well. Um, and then just next to Ian is uh, Thomas Moritz and Thomas and Gabby uh, from up at Cheshunt, um, Chess Hunt, uh, Chess Hunt, yeah, uh, north of us in the high country. Uh, they've got a mixed farm. Um, I know they've got dairy goats and um, they produce beautiful whole grain products from their stone milled flour uh, for markets and for the local community. Um, we're really lucky to have uh, people coming down from the country to be sharing sort of the real history of how they started milling and, and why they started milling. Uh, particularly, we're lucky that uh, Thomas and Gabby decided that to keep Gabby in the country so that she would continue to eat beautiful food. They got the mill in the first place because she was about to leave and go back home to, <laughs> to Europe because there was no damn good bread around in the local area. Adam Rivett is the next miller along, and uh, he and his wife Florence are up at Millua. They've got Millua Bread and Millua Kitchen. Um, they've got a, a stone mill as well, and um, Adam has an extremely um, diverse set of skills, which I guess everybody on this panel does, but he's been working in kitchens and wineries. Um, he trained as an um, electrical engineer. Did you specialise in electrical engi but en engineer? Mechanical engineering, yeah, just so that he could um, be a um, technician in the kitchen and fix things, which is pretty much what he does every week, I know that. He also mills and bakes. Um, and then James Fisher is uh, another stalwart of the grains community. Um, he's, he's got a mill at... James is... Um, he's a roving miller baker, and his mill is always kind of connected to him. I don't know where it is. I, I sort of kind of always imagine your mill is just behind you in a shadow form because you... I don't know where it is physically located, but... I, I know you're always nearby, <laughs> and I see your flower all around the place, around Victoria. Um, always a great voice, always got lots of ideas, very creative um, solutions to all kinds of challenges and problems that um, local um, food practitioners face. So very valuable. And then Robert Pekin, the next man along here, um, he is, has come down from Brisbane, and he's been a stalwart of food hub building up in Brisbane through Food Connect Brisbane, but also um, The Shed, uh, which is now called, um, I think you really, it's the Salisbury Shed and Mill, I think. It's yeah, Salisbury. Salisbury Mill, yeah. Yep, so that's an, um, another close connection with Sustainable Table. Um, they're really partnering together to um, leverage funding um, towards creating a very comprehensive food hub up there. And um, that mill, um, well, you can talk about it, but yet yeah, it's another stone mill um, that has come via uh, Ian and his brother Hamish um, back down in the Rutherglen Berrigan um, area. 
And um, next to Robert is Jason. Um, Jason's an old friend of mine and um, been lucky enough to work for Jason and Emma in the last three months at Turong Farm. And really, uh, these guys have been um, farming and growing various things, including grapes, um, but more recently, since 2016, a really diverse um, array of cereal grains right up the top of the Mornington Peninsula in a region that's not really known for wheat growing. So they've taken the challenge up and um, to kind of put in place some ideas about diversity and about um, layering various enterprises on their farm, including grazing, um, cover cropping. Uh, there's some beautiful black cattle on that property. Um, they've got beef production going, but also most recently, Following the milling operation over the last few years, uh, they've added a bakery, and um, that's also deepened their connections to their local community and their customers on the Mornington Peninsula. So I'm going to ask you all to pass the microphone along and just give us a bit of an outline of how you approach your milling and, and what your mill is firstly, how it, how it actually works, whether it's a single pass, whether there's a circulation that occurs, and um, what you like about your final product. Thanks, Ian. Um, so our mills, we run both a New American Stone Mill as well as a very similar style mill that me and my brother Hamish built, um, which runs, a, and they both got natural granite stones. Um, it's very simple milling, I guess you could say. It's just grain in, single pass, and we, we aim for a very fine whole grain flour that comes out. Um, we're not tempering the grain, so we're grinding the bran quite small. Um, and we run that probably five, six days a week and do yeah two, about two tonne a week at the moment. Um, and then with the addition of the sifter, we're looking to mainly with retail flour, um, just provide a high extraction so just sifting down what we currently have, are producing to produce something that's just, it still carries the, a fair bit of the nutrition and a, a lot of the flavour of the stone ground, whole grain, but just is a little bit easier to work with so that people um, aren't wanting to blend with other flowers as much. They can get everything from us locally, basically. Um, yes, thanks, Emily, for you know, telling that you know we've been you know, still here because we are milling grain, okay? As we said, we came 35 years ago, we brought a little mill with us and Gabby was gonna go back home, you know, because the, we couldn't eat the bread here. That was basically it. So I got thrown into the deep end, Gabby was the main uh, chef, cook, uh, whatever you wanna call it. And from there on, we, we bought Osteola Getreidemühlen, which means it's one of the original mills back in Europe. They've been building those mills for about 80 years. Okay, so they're built in Austria, and there's a few offsprings of those ones. Okay, so you get the Waldner, you get the uh, the Skippy grain mills, you know, all those ones. You know, they're basically offsprings of the <coughs> Osteola. Ours is a stone mill, it's a 500 mil stone mill, and we try to produce only whole grain flour. And whole grain flour with the most nutrition left in it, which means, you know, we mill reasonably slow, but also reasonably cold. So everything, all the grains which come through, the whole lot goes through, and nothing comes out more than 30 degrees, okay? So we try to maintain all the vitamins in the grain when we mill it. <clears throat> and also, the flour we mill, it most probably gets used the next 12 hours, which makes it really, really fickle in using and baking bread. So we, we are one of the very few, I suppose, we don't use white flour. I, I, can't, I can't bake with white flour, I'm sorry. You know, so if you ask questions about white flour, ask all the other guys, <laughs> not me. Uh, and we, we, it's, it's just a tricky situation you know, with freshly grained whole grain milling. And the thing is, my aim is basically to produce the most nutritious flour and bread, you know, which we sell at markets and in the cafe. We've got a cafe, so that's where it all goes in. All the products are whole grain. Pastries, bread, the whole lot. All right. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, we're actually based not far from Thomas and Ian, uh, so we're actually pretty lucky to, to be in a very small area with uh, such a large uh, amount of uh, stone mills. Um, 
We mill a similar amount to uh, Ian and Courtney each week. We've got the capacity to mill more, but we've actually cut back due to uh, my exuberance, I suppose. Um, we, we have several mills. Uh, my wife imports or did uh, French mills. Um, we have a range of sizes. We've got a, a 30 centimetre stone, we've got a 50 centimetre stone, a 70 and a, and a metre. Um, we also have the mock mill and then lots of different small mills um, of varying sizes. So we've got a collection. Um, and, and to be honest, most of them are, view, are used every week, depending on what we're milling. We, we mill a diverse range of grains. We mill corn, we mill uh, millet, we mill rye, we mill wheat, um, buckwheat. Uh, and that's our philosophy within the, in the bakery, is to, to mill a diverse range of grains. So, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know. I've got an Osti roller mill. It's a Osti 500. Um, so it's got a half meter stone on it. It's a composite stone, so it's not granite. Uh, it has a sifter, so I, I bolt the flour as well as producing whole flour. Um, I spent quite a long time baking using my own flour. And I think that gave me some sort of depth of insight into understanding the process of milling and how it, the nuance of the, the milling process engages or interacts with the nuances of the sourdough baking process. Um, but I don't bake anymore. Uh, I just produce flour and sell it to the bakers of Melbourne, um, which has allowed me to be producing more flour, um, which ultimately is, I think, the game that I'm in is, you know, getting more of the land coverage of Victoria into being biodynamic or organic soil, uh, soil system um, through the sale of <coughs> organic biodynamic flour. Um, most of my flour, almost all my flour, comes from these wonderful people over here. Say hello. Um, Do you mean their grain? Coming? Their grain, yeah. sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that, that, does that say everything? Thanks. I think so. It doesn't say everything. <laughs> we sat around the fire on the first night and you told me all sorts of things about your operation. Um, so, yeah, we've got a, uh, a Woodstock uh, stone mill built by Ian and Hamish. Um, uh, it's a one metre, I think. I haven't really measured the rock, um, but it's <laughs> it's 400 kilos of, um, of rock on top of another 400 kilos of granite from just up the road here at, um, what's the name of the? Harcourt, yeah, from a, uh, from a, um, a quarry up there. Um, so it's just because we're in Brisbane, I was very cognizant of um, not having any timber in the mill, so it's just steel and rock. Um, it's a beautiful mill. Amish and Nian did an amazing job. Uh, when we, and, and I've never milled flour before, so we commissioned it in the middle of COVID. Just rang Ian and Hamish thinking, someone must be making mills in Australia. You know, this is, everyone's making bread in the middle of COVID. You know, surely there's a demand for someone to build mills. And Ian said, no, no one. There's no one I know of. And then um, said, but Ian and Hamish, that Hamish, um, him and his brother are thinking of building one. And I said, well, you're building two. So, um, <laughs> so that was a, a, you know, an amazing process involving the whole community at Berrigan and um, engineers and all sorts of, and trying to find you know, granite mm. <laughs> um, that would do the job. It's a beautiful mill. It, it, um, uh, Cal, Uncle Kel is um, one of, he's my fellow miller and Emily who's just sitting here, she's come on as the, as the number one miller now. So she's milling uh, flour. We've been trialling milling with all sorts of grains over the last year and a half. We've just finished building the mill room to make it all certified and um, you know food safe and all that sort of stuff inside of the hub. Um, and the reason we built it, well, the reason why I commissioned it was because um, I've been in fresh food and dairy farming all of my life. And um, it wasn't until COVID that suddenly I realised that this, the, the product we eat uh, is in all of our diets was just um, uh, was we, no one knew what fresh flour was in Brisbane like there's no fresh flour in Brisbane unless you order it through um, Gunnedah so it was like a real penny dropping for me that this ubiquitous substance called flour um, you know in I don't know 60% of our diet is, mm. is flour um, and I thought wow this is how can that be possible so um, so we're, we're um, 
Um, we're working with a lot of Indigenous uh, groups. We've tried milling and aspirating um, uh, gamelay or Mitchell grass. Uh, the other day we made damper with, a, we've got a couple of Indigenous, um, we've got lots of kitchen, we've got 32 tenants in the, in the shed who all want to play around with the flowers. Um, we've got one Indigenous chef called um, Chris Jordan from Three Little Birds and he got us milling cupabunda and um, sword grass. Sword grass, not spear grass, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, um, so we're really exciting working with Indigenous people because we are in the lands of um, the oldest millers and bakers in the world and we need to really acknowledge that and, um, and in particular the women who were probably the main millers at the time. Um, so we want to sort of bring back that, that economy and bring back that connection to native grains and perennial native, you know, bring back that, that um, because our Indigenous uh, boy, you know, um, kids need to go out in the country and to rediscover those amazing millets and rices and, and grains. So that's, that's our goal with the Salisbury Mill. It's a traineeship for Indigenous kids to find a, a way back to country and be, get, their, get, them, get their minds and their hands busy um, and your hearts. You know, milling is, a, as we all know, it's an amazing, it's an amazing process. It's very visceral. Um, we're still figuring it out. We've only been milling for a, a year. Um, but it's, um, it's such a, um, a beautiful thing to, um, to do. Hi everyone. Uh, we operate uh, two mills. One of them's a, a double stone mill, uh, so like two turntables. Uh, the rocks are, uh, turn very slowly at 24 RPM. Um, we produce all kinds of flour uh, from that mill. There's a, a sifter attached so we can do high extraction flour, whole grain flour, what have you. Um, it's connected to a, a grain transport system that's pneumatic, so uh, both the grain and the flour uh, are maintained at an ambient temperature the whole time through the mill. Um, the sifter, you can change uh, the mesh, so we usually run an 80 mesh sifter, which is about 200 micron, and to produce an 85% extracted flour, um, we do about 100 kilos an hour. We can do it a bit quicker, uh, but the flour I feel is not as good. Uh, we also run a, a roller mill. Uh, roller mills uh, are much maligned because they're association with um, industrial food system, but uh, our experience has been that you can produce any kind of flour from a roll mill that you can produce in a stone mill and some other flowers as well. Um, so our roller mill, same kind of system in terms of integrated uh, sifting and transport, so it's cool the whole time. Um, and yeah, with both the versatile systems, they're uh, mills that I bought because of uh, originally price and I had a room in a container coming from China, um, but we've found them to be really suitable for what we do and um, function very well. And of course, there's a very long history of milling in China, so they know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, Jace, can you hold on to the microphone? I, yeah. I just want everybody after this to, to run back down the line. Um, just maybe comment about the, the grain quality, that um, your thoughts on grain quality and also connections back to the farmer, whether that can be improved, whether there are some thoughts you have on um, quality and seasonal variation um, that really need to be um, communicated back down to the end user, the, the recipients of your flour. You are a farmer, of course, Jason, but I know you do grow um, grains with other farmers. So, yeah. It's, it's so, the grain is different every year, even the same variety. Um, so, you have to respond to that in your milling and, of course, the baker in the baking. Um, in terms of grain quality, it's great to get beautiful, uh, well-developed grain that hits a p certain protein point or actually potentiates uh, the grain um, potential. So if it's a hard red or hard white wheat, you know, it hits that, uh, those protein marks that people enjoy. Um, and also a falling number so, um, so that uh, it's actually got the goods when you want to bake with it. Um, the other aspects are uh, moisture content, and moisture content um, sometimes uh, it's you know, under 12 per cent. If you, you want your grain under 13 per cent for storage, but it actually mills better at, um, 
a bit higher percentage. Uh, we don't temper our, our grain, but Jesus, I wish we did sometimes. So um, some hard reds and hard whites are pretty hard going through the mill, um, and some uh, softer um, grains just you know explode into instant flour, and it's beautiful to mill like. Uh, Iron Biodynamics spell. It's just the, oh, it's a dream to mill that stuff. <laughs> um, and uh, what else can I tell you about um, milling and coming straight from the farm? The other thing is cleaning. So sometimes it doesn't come off the paddock perfectly clean. So we've got some cleaning equipment, but we're restricted to uh, the cleaning equipment we have. If I get grain professionally milled and all the screenings are taken out, everything's uniform size, and then run it through the mill. Um, it's easier, of course, but because of our system of having a sifter attached to the mill, um, you can adjust it so that you can still achieve the flour you want, but you take off that chaff and gloom and you know bits of crap that are in there that um, you know limit um, flour quality. Um, and, I, and how yeah. do you go um, communicating some of those variations to your um, flour customers? Uh, so most of the grain I have analysed and I can tell them what it's like, but I mean we now have a bakery, but we also have relationships with our bakery customers, so I can see uh, Hannah's here, and so I, I ask them, you know, how's it going, what's this one like, and it's great to get that feedback. Um, but yeah, the general acceptance of uh, I guess lack of uniformity from uh, year to year and also throughout the year, things change in the silo, um, even at the same grain. Um, bakers still would like that Caputo-like consistency, but it's not uh, uh, what I can provide. Uh, we definitely aim for it, but there's always some variation. And even day to day, you know, if it's two different people operating the mill, there's actually different results. So, mm, thanks. Um, yeah, we um, we don't temper our grain, so it's because uh, we're in Brisbane. It's very humid, so we found, uh, except for rice, when we ground rice, it was so hard. It really took us a couple of days to figure out how to get that to a consistency that um, our a couple of we, in the kitchen we've got a couple of Asian um, chefs who who really fascinated by the whole process of of using rice flour. Um, it's a, it's a very high end use, so in normally you don't use rice flour. Rice flour is not a... It's a very um, specialty. It's, it's only used at weddings and things like that. But the um, the grains, we've used Ian's, all Ian's grains, um, uh, his rosella and his spitfire, and we've put a, uh, a couple of bags of Baxter through the other day, which was really soft. Like, it, it, same thing, it just exploded into flour. I was like, wow, this is like a dream. Um, uh, um, but we're still learning. Um, obviously, our role is to sort of relay what the farmers and have. We've got three bakers who have been trialling, a Russian baker, a German baker and a French baker. Um, the Russian baker just wants it straight as soon as it comes out of the mill. She just loves that volatility and that, you know, where the enzymes and the life is just exploding. Um, she plays around with that. The French baker wants it four days after it's been milled. Exactly, like he calls that the maturing of the, of the flour. Um, and the German baker, he doesn't want it for ten days. He wants it, like, dead almost <laughs> for his because he's such a purist and he just wants the you know he wants the consistency but I, it's like weird um and then of course we've got um all sorts of other people in the kitchen who are just going to make cookies and banana breads and just all sorts of things and play around with us so our sort of we're not going to get too um you know, if a baker wants something too consistent, we're, we're going to say, listen, you know, probably not for us. Um, or you can try blending it maybe 10% and use your, your normal flour, and then maybe over time they might um, get, a, get a, a liking for the flavour and the texture and, the, and, and, the, and, and um, uh, you know, whatever comes out of the products that they're making. But our main role is to communicate that um, the seasons are going to be varying, the grains are going to be variable, and we just want them to have that experience and go with that journey um, with us as millers. It's never going to be perfect. And for the future, we're looking at in terms of a whole food system approach. We need um, we need bakes, bakers and chefs and and cooks all going with the flow a lot more than having this um, this this consistent product. We don't sift. We don't want to sift. Um, but um, uh, there's plenty of sifted flour out there they can buy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's really that much of a big deal. Uh, I think that any baker who's got his chops on 
deals and responds with the subtle variations that there are. And to me, day-to-day, uh, -day, week to week, the variance in the quality of the flower is subtle. It's, it's subtle. And it, yeah, it, really it's down to, you know, eyeballing it when you put the bassinage in and you know like dealing with it in the bowl I'd, i haven't really seen any sort of results when i've been baking with my flour that that are difficult to deal with at all um and the people who are buying flour from me uh, and i think i'd probably speak for anybody on this panel you know they're people who really care about the quality of their product and the flavor and the nutrition and they've probably been in the game for a while and they've got their chops you know so i don't think there's any there's any issue there and certainly nothing that isn't just resolved day to day in good communication i i think probably like we're all on this the same sort of level here where I make the flour, I deliver it to the bakers and I talk to them and I talk to my farmers and, you know, we all know one another and we all talk with one another all of the time. So, you know, if there's something that needs, I don't, I don't think, it, do you remember a time where it has, where I've sort of come back to you and gone, hey, I need to talk to you about your grain, you know? It's, it's pretty, it, I, in my experience, it's pretty consistent certainly well within the um yeah the the bounds that the bakers can deal with and you know I, that might that might also be that i mean i've got a kind of suck it up attitude you know like right. you know it's flour deal with it like you know it's not hard so yeah let's you're yeah. You're, you're getting your grain direct from some farmers and and through a middle dealer some some uh, grain, or is it mostly no it's farmer? well Look, my flour comes, sorry, my grain comes from Stephen Tanya. Yeah. It does like bounce through the biodynamic marketing company along the way. Mm -hmm. But this is really just for the conveniences of logistics, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. It's easier for the freight company to dump the grain in Lilydale and then, because, which is close to me. And, and then I, I can- the grain that comes direct from the barn is very well cleaned. It's, it's yes, it's that's right. It's really super well. clean. So, yeah, super but that can be an issue if you are dealing with other yeah. farmers, if they don't have on farm infrastructure that enables them to, really they're used to um, delivering straight off the header pretty much into a bulk silo and, yeah, and not dealing right. with yeah. smaller mills. Um, it'll be a different story yeah. and you may need to put that infrastructure in place in, at your mill yeah. site, which can be an added... Yeah, um, I think uh, I'm blessed, right? You know, like, uh, so maybe that's giving me like a siloed yeah, but it, perspective. But, yeah, yeah, but that's a good relationship yeah. right there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, James. <laughs> Thanks, James. Look, I'm a little bit with James. Where we, over the past, have got grain off uh, Ian and Courtney and Burham. Thank you. Grain's beautiful. Um, we also grew grain for a couple of years. So um, that's been our stock, but we're, we're out of that now. Um, you know, we're just, we don't ha have an issue with, with quality of grain at the moment. But going forward, I think if there's, there's more and more growers, then, yeah, there's that potential um, to be able to have those communications with farmers. Um, and, and I'm not sure how I have that. Um, it's not a skill level that I've got to to be talking to the farmers about. I think it works both ways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everybody learns, and you just. And I think that's a, I think that's a new stage and a new step once that happens. Mm. But you know, um, at the moment, uh, grain quality is is beautiful. And and look, I'm with James. You know, um, we don't we sell a very little amount of retail flour at, at the shop. But our focus, you know, our customers um, are my bakers. Um, mm. We mill for ourselves. So uh, I'm a bit like James, you know, I've baked for 20 years. If my bakers can't deal with it, you know, suck it up. Yeah. You know, oh, I can yeah. do it, so can you. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, you know, that's our focus, is to, to mill flour um, each week, um, to mill nutritious, um, high, highly dense flour and put back into our um, product. Um, if You're also buying some flour? Yeah, look, we are, yeah, and a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but our focus, you know, over the next few years is to, um, in stages, um, yeah. cut that out. And look, you know, we've had three very clear steps. The first one was to, as we were a very, were a very big operation, we've cut that back by half. Mm -hmm. um, you know, initially benchtop mills were for milling whole grain flour for feeds. Um, mm -hmm. That was step one. Mm 
you know, it's a small step and we ticked that off. Next stage was that all of the whole grain flour that was um, in the building um, was milled by us. We've ticked that one off as well. Um, the next stage was um, high extraction flour um, and we're pretty close to ticking that one off. Mm -hmm. um, and then that sort of finer um, white flour that we're using, that's an interesting one at the moment because there's a training within the bakery for the bakers. Mm -hmm. um, we're moving away from that to the high extraction flour, but there's a real training for both the customer base mm -hmm. and also our bakers. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where we're at at the moment. Thanks, Adam. We were always in the lucky position not to be in the position yep. like Adam is, because <laughs> we, nev we never made white fluffy bread. So we always made whole grain bread. <clears throat> so we are also in a slightly different position like everybody else here, because we've been buying grains from a lot of suppliers over the last 35 years from Australia. We started off with, I'm not sure if people remember, organic technology, you know, from Wagga Wagga, there was Alan Drews, you know, all the grain now that they produce that goes into licorice, okay, organic licorice. But we used to buy grain from them. We used to buy rye grain from Ian's dad. <laughs> Ian wasn't even on the planet then, <laughs> I think. <laughs> You've got, I'm not sure, I think it was your sisters actually. <laughs> We're talking about early, early 90s, you know, mid 90s. So, and then we also, we had a very, very good relationship, you know, we were basically uh, test bakers, you know, for Andrew Fawcett, you know, Paulette Hill. You know, we're talking 16, 17, 18 years ago when, he's, when they started milling, so they've, they've got a stone mill. And when Andrew put, pulled this, you know, the new crop off, you know, we got a few bags, you know, tested it and baked and, you know, it was, it was sort of a really good relationship with Pilot Hill. Um, we also had a, you know, baking relationship with Murfak. I'm not sure if people remember Murfak, you know, from, from Benalla. They've got about, they've got six stone mills, you know. So a lot of people don't know them at all. So it's, and we, our biggest change basically came when we hit a reasonable snag back in most probably 2007, 2008. We got some grain from Pilot Hill and we milled it and the bread was crap, absolutely dead. You know, we couldn't believe it. You know, we went back to Andrew and this and we just could not work out, you know, what was going on. In the end, you know, we did a lot of research and we found a company which was called Mühlenchemie in Germany. And it's quite amazing. I've, I brought a little, uh, you can take a photo of this, but this company, they pride themselves of treating, treating 15% of the world's consumption of flour, which makes it 50 million tons, all right? And they've got about 500 different additives that, to standardize flour. And unfortunately, a lot of those additives then don't have to declare because they're all a lot of enzymes and enzymes are not considered to be a chemical. So they don't have to put them on the list. So they, I've got the book down there, if some people, it's the most expensive book I ever bloody bought, you know. It cost me, <laughs> cost me $300 or $350, a tiny little book, you know. <laughs> you can have a, have a look at it, it's, it's in English. <laughs> so, yeah, but those, those really, brought it back to us, you know, what's been done with our flour. And we did find out, they were very helpful, they thought they found a new customer, you know, so <laughs> we were only extracting information from them. So they, they basically hinted at us, you know, what was happening. And if you look at that list, you know, how you can treat, you know, bug damaged, starch damaged, you know, heat damaged, water damaged, water locked, and, 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 and. You go through the whole process of the production, milling, and whatever. You can do anything with any grain, you know, and you have a consistent product at the end of the, end of the day. So hence, the flour, you know, from, or grain from Barham Dynamics, you know, is exactly the same as the grain which comes out of WA, you know. The product is the same, and Sunny Crust is happy again, okay. So, and I think, that was our biggest change and we thought, well, we need to change this. We need to go to really, really whole grain and educate people about the dangers of sifted and milled commercial flour. I'm not talking about Ian's, you know, he doesn't fiddle with enzymes, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> and he never will be. <laughs> okay. 
So and I think you know that's a very very important factor. You know, so we have been through all the grain. I, mean, oh, I wouldn't say all the grain manufacturers, but at the moment we buy grain. You know, at the rye grain comes from Barham Dynamics or from Ian's Ian's dad. Uh, the Wheat comes from either Pete, Pete Hurcott or from Ian or Barry Edwards, you know, which is, in the <coughs> is a biodynamic grower. Uh, Paulette Hill supplies some spelt sometimes and, and it depends, you know, how their crops are going or the spelt we get from, I forget his name, from near Horsham as a grower down there. So we stick to 100% Victorian or in Ian's case, Berrigan way uh, grain. You know, we don't go any further. We've had whole grain, uh, grain milled as well a long time ago, but we just stick locally, you know. And I think that's what we need to do. And I think for people like, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, there's, not, there's not many other bakers, millers on, on, on the panel, but if you are, you, it's, it's a challenge, you know. Freshly milled whole grain flour, you know, is a challenge, you know. As, you know as you said, you know, suck it up or leave it or something, you know, it's, yeah, that's a, it's a good saying, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's difficult. <laughs> All right, thanks. thanks. Ian. Um, I think in terms of consistency, because of our scale, we can, we're using the same parcel of grain for a whole year or even two years, as we are still now. We're still in, well, we're still in 2021 harvest Spitfire wheat. And so actually we've had a lot of feedback saying that this stuff is more consistent than what a lot of people can get um, because it's not blended and changed. So it's a single origin, single parcel of grain that we store um, for however long we need to. But I think what um, the really important thing is and why Steve and Tan are such great suppliers of grain is because of their storage protocols. And that's a really hard thing for, like if we're sort of asking other farmers to expand this sort of industry, which is what we're basing it on. You need to get that good, clean grain. And that's really, really difficult. And the storage is really difficult. And so um, you see a lot of people who will sell a couple of bags to someone and it'll be great, and, but then aren't able to keep that consistency because either they get sick of doing little bags or... And so I think we just need to remember that that is a really big sticking point for milling um, and access to grains. So, but um, it's also really important. So I think it's one of those things, I think there's a few projects happening at the moment where we can collectivise and there's definite things that can happen. But before we can see that expand, I think, yeah, there's a bit of work to be done. Thanks, Ian. Um, now going to get a bit troubles. We're going to talk about training in the milling industry. We can maybe get to that, but I really want to ask a hard question now. Um, everybody's buying and growing their own grain on this panel. I'm wondering how flexible they are with regards to nutrition. This, this does relate to um, human nutrition and also um, soil health. But how flexible are you um, about the way those grains are grown? Um, looking forward, um, there's various stages of transition in agriculture um, that people are aiming to um, respond to the virtuous um, processor aim. Um, there are customers who are wanting to buy uh, food products from a virtuous uh, producer or a virtuous processor. Um, okay, you're small scale, you're, you're localising your grain economy, but it's not always uh, possible to get um, the highest, um, lowest input grain um, that you can. I know we've had a good few years, um, but I also know that back in 2018, 2019, in our context over in South Australia, we could not get rye grain. And um, our wheat grain was incredibly drought affected and suck it and see, wait until you get back there, you know, it's really, really hard to use that kind of grain. So how flexible are you? How forgiving are you of um, transition stages in farming to try to reach um, something that where everybody's sort of getting a much higher quality? <laughs> um, I mean, for us, where the reason we mill is because we want to be farming a certain way, and that way is uh, organic, low input system, uh, integrating animals and keeping people on the land and re revitalising that country. So I guess we are very strict 
Um, we've been lucky that we've been able to store enough through the better years to get through the tough years. Um, when we have had to buy grain off uh, mum and dad's farm or our farm, we've gone to our wider network of organic growers and sort of been able to buy it off the header or and then take those cleaning and storage um, parts that are tricky. Uh, and going forward, I mean, we've we've thought about, I mean, James mentioned earlier, like trying to get, um, like if we see the mill as a lever for helping more people grow a certain way or grow the way they want to and then be rewarded for it financially, um, the, our mill would need to be much, much bigger. Um, and so, like the scale that we're milling at is like, it's only sort of 50 to 100 acres of grain in a good year which is very small, really. Um, yeah, so, yeah, if we were to get bigger, then there's different ideas about um, certifications and transitions and stuff like that. And I know there's, you know, that the whole grain milling certified sustainable is sort of, uh, I guess that's that idea that they've, they couldn't get enough organic grain and so have had to bring in a new standard, which is better than the alternative. And yeah, so it's quite interesting, but I'll let everyone else speak. Thanks. For uh, for us, the the cleaning has you know as as a use of grain has hasn't actually never been a big problem because we found most farmers you know we bought the grain from they've had good enough cleaning equipment you know and they're more than proud of you know to do a good job you know so so all the farmers really we've been dealing with you know including Ian you know and whatever you know they they've done a good job in cleaning so the the cleaning is not an issue storing different ball game. And that's where you know started before you know when we had this problem with the with, with our grain 15 years ago, and we went back to Andrew. You know, didn't quite finish then. And what happened was is they had a big crop and they had a lot of grain and it was stored in the silos. <clears throat> the grain was harvested in summer. It went through the first winter, went into the next springtime. Okay, went into the next uh, through summer, autumn. And that's when, the, when, when it started to become difficult because all of a sudden, through one and a half cycles, that grain sold. For me, well, it's really time to start sprouting, you know, because it was in the silo. It went through all the temperature changes, like a normal grain would go when you plant it. So the storage is an, is an issue. And then what happened was there was starch damage. Serious starch damage was done in that grain, you know, and it didn't, you know, when you baked it, it didn't gelatinize anymore, you know. When you had this sort of layout down the bottom, you think it's been undercooked and it's been this, and it just didn't set properly anymore, okay. So I think the storage is, a, is, a, is an issue, and we've got to be careful that, you know, that we don't store the grain, you know, at going through all those temperature cycles, you know for any length of time. You know, that could be an issue for some, some farmers. Uh, training, for us the training is easy because it's on the job. <laughs> so, so we mill it, we use it, I see the effects straight away, okay? If there is a, a, a vitamin or, or a quality issue because the grain, that's, I don't know that. But we try to minimize our effects on the processing, you know, to to damage any more. Okay, so we try to, like the vitamin B, vitamin B1, B6, you know, they're very, very heat sensitive. Vitamin C is heat sensitive. Folates are heat sensitive. Vitamin B group, you can actually increase the temperature, you know, sensitivity, you know, if it runs through an acidic, including sourdough process. So once it goes in and it's in the dough, you can bring it up the temperature up to 100 degrees before baking, and it usually doesn't get to that in, internally. So, but therefore, you have to make sure the vitamins are still in there before you start making the dough. So that means the milling process needs to be on a low temperature. So it's a, it's a, it's a. I think the working together between us, the millers, the bakers, and the growers, you know, is really, really crucial, and we need that. Uh, feedback, you know, from anybody, you know, the grower needs to ask continuously, you know, find out 
Okay, how's your grain going? How's it going with the baking? And, 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 you know, we need that feedback, you know? And most bakers, unfortunately, they're under real time pressure, money pressure, you know, they, 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 they just, they haven't got the time to play around with it, you know? But we need to get back to that. We need that feedback, and then we can make sure the customer gets a top product, you know? And it's a top product for your body, not for your eyes, okay? That's what we need. Thanks, Thomas. You've already kind of touched on it, haven't you? But yeah, with the, your relationship with farmers. But yeah, if yeah. you have anything more to add, that would be. So, but training as well? Um, more, really, I'm looking at where you get your grain from year on year in times of scarcity. Yeah. Um, how far are you willing to go um, maybe back into the conventional grain um, supply? Um, and how. Far, what sort of long-term thinking do you have around grain? Well, I'd like to say no, but we haven't been challenged to that stage yeah. yet because we've yeah. been very lucky. Yeah. Um, oh, I suppose, actually, no. Um, so we've, we've been using polenta for 20 years uh, and there's supposedly a polenta shorter, shortage in the country. Um, uh, luckily, Ian put us onto a contact uh, a few weeks ago and we sourced organic um, gristing corn um, in New South Wales. Um, so... That's been absolutely fantastic and started a new journey within the bakery that we, we wanted to start. And we've been trialling over the last couple of years. Um, but speaking to the farmer is an interesting one because I think it's very relative to this question is that he's in his 70s. Um, he's getting rid of the farm. So, you know, we're losing, losing somebody from the farming fraternity and not just the farming fraternity but from um, organic growing um, fraternity. Um, with He's access, being flexible with the quantities that is yeah. supplied you, yeah, yeah. Maybe oh, the well, next generation will just be more wanting to put it on a shipping container. And absolutely, it yeah. I mean, look, we, we drove up there and, and picked up a couple of ton, but um, I mean, he was great. Like he goes, oh, I'll drive three ton down for you. I mean, it, most of the people we'd speak to would be, you know, a truck. Yeah, and we're not set up to do that. That's one of our challenges for the size of our milling operation is we haven't got the infrastructure. That that's our biggest challenge. We haven't. We our infrastructure doesn't match our milling capacity, yep. so, yeah. Yeah, let alone storage, I guess. Yeah. yeah. It isn't a problem that I've had to face. Um, maybe I'm just, like, optimistic for hopefully I won't ever have to. But um, I think, yeah, it, it, in line with what I said earlier about keeping communication really broad and open with both suppliers and customers. Um, I think if, if organic and biodynamic grain were completely unavailable because something really terrible happened, I would go to my customers and say, what do you want to do about this? You know, I can't supply you with organic and biodynamic uh, flour. Um, do you want me to mill some conventional flour for you? I'd, you know, I'd look to what I could source and have the mo find the most virtuous solution that I could to that problem when it arose. So I, I, th I think just that. But yeah, I, I guess I'm providing a service to my customers, so I'd be talking to them about that problem. Uh, yeah. Um, we're um, because we run a food hub. We've got a pretty. Um, and we're not about certification per se. We're really interested in the character of the farm and where the farmer is going in terms of their journey to more diversified growing and becoming more resilient. Um, because it's grain, it's it's a dry product, so the ecological impact is you can go you know a lot further afield than um, than a lettuce or a, or something that you should be growing in your backyard. So for us, it's not a really big issue. Um, we're really um, uh, and this is like sustainable table, we're really interested in how the infrastructure and the logistics will operate up and down the eastern seaboard, including South Australia, in terms of um, pro you know, providing that resilience. Um, our main focus, though, is on training and training Indigenous kids. So we, you know, it, it'd be great to have, a, you know, 10 mills in Brisbane all um, grinding flour to provide that experience. and and flavour and um, nutritional profile that um, people can experience and get close to and really discover and, and then get become become connected to this whole other world of just eating something that's whole and fresh. Um, so that's our main role is, is, is to stimulate that um, economy. We don't see 
going to be too many problems with accessing, you know, grain growers. There's plenty of grain. You know, I think um, the 60 million we feed is is meat, grain, and uh, what's the other thing that we grow in excess? Sugar. You know, so it's a bit of a furphy. I mean, <clears throat> from a resilience point of view, um, there's a lot of other things: seafood, fruit and veg, milk. Now we now import milk. Um, um, so there's there's a lot of other challenges on the food systems point of view, uh, but I think flour because it is so ubiquitous in our diet, it's a, it's it's sort of like the um, it's like the anchor um, staple that we can use to communicate a, a much bigger story about our food system and and how um, uh, not to say how you know we're, the the agricultural journey we've been on, particularly over the last forty or fifty years. Has, is at a point now where we know that that road is, is, is you know, has, we have to take a fork in the road, and so it's for all of us to sort of help society go down other, you know, many other forks in the road and discover something new for themselves. In terms of storage, I think uh, that was an important point I, I actually didn't think of in terms of a nutritional context, but our storage is in sealed silos with a system similar to um, Ian um, and uh, probably Burren, I'm not sure, which is um, temperature and humidity control um, by electronic means. And um, when I fill a silo, we blow in some diatomaceous earth that uh, if insects get in there, it desiccates the carapace of the insect before they, they breed. It seems, seems to work well. Can you um, just quickly describe what the um, conventional Ah, um, uh, look, Maldison or something like that, it, um, as it's going into the silo. Um, mind you, uh, conventional growers will use the techniques that uh, I use as well, but they pour Maldison or, um, as it goes into the silo, or they also um, fumigate it with um, a phosphine gas or something like that, which works really well, of course. Yeah. Um, so, in terms of training, uh, I haven't done any formal training in milling. It's been um, just picking it up as so I went along. And so when we've had other people milling uh, at Churong, um, I show them the basics and then they work it out. Um, and I found that everyone has their own style and there ends up being a um, fairly consistent product, but there's definitely people will pull it up a bit quicker than, say, I do, because um, they're worried about... Um, yeah, so, yeah, so um, in terms of uh, um, um, farming technique and um, so we grow in a low input system so uh, we don't use uh, the same amount of ag chem that uh, conventional growers do. So if you look at um, whole grain milling sustainability standard, we use a, a lot less that's in that standard. Um, in terms of bulking up grain of specialist varieties, uh, we use every tool in the box. I'm more interested in getting enough seed of different things. Um, there's a, uh, <coughs> probably some ideological opposition to that, um, but I'm focused on diversity in grain and just getting it out there. Um, in terms of our milling wheats, um, we uh, quite happy with how we grow and it suits our land and our scale um, most importantly and um, I'd actually like to do some testing um, <coughs> of everyone's grain in terms of um, uh, quality of nutritional value and things like that and year on year. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have been doing that because I, I mean you've got an amazing farming system and mm. it'd be great to um, I, I guess see to prove what you guys already know. Um, so, uh, are, you, are you referring to lab testing, Jace? Is it? Is yeah, that la you're... lab testing like of plants and grain and soil, but year on year data. Yep. Um, and I think I really think in twenty years that uh, a lot of these things that we have a feeling about now will be they'll have science the hell out of all of it. So it, it we'll know a lot more. Um, and, mm, what would yeah. the minimum tests be, like useful ones, do you think? Uh, I think uh, well, for soil function, things like carbon and um, the hydrological cycle, things like that, water penetration, I know you guys have done some work there. Um, and um, in terms of grain quality, um, 
Well, I mean, there's always a protein level. We talk about uh, nutrition in grain, and we're often always talking about the bran and the bran layer. We don't often talk about um, the ability of the brain, uh, the body to absorb uh, the nutrition that's available, and that mm. sometimes comes down to the genetics of the grain. <coughs> and um, yeah, we don't often talk about, uh, well, I guess in this context we do, with sourdough enabling the absorption of things that typically aren't uh, absorbable. Mm -hmm. um, so I think yeah, from a nutritional point of view, there's probably uh, a genetic basis and a um, farming technique basis to that. Um, there's certainly plenty of, um, uh, I guess what you'd say, certified grain that's um, not um, nutritious. Yeah. Uh, is anybody on the panel doing any testing of their grain prior to milling? Um, anything? Anybody using that? We, we were using the bricks meter for all of our veggies um, to, to give, like Steve was talking about yesterday, but uh, we haven't done that on the grain yet. We've got a bricks meter and we'd like to use that a bit more, particularly after what Steve said yesterday. <laughs> Moisture levels, yep. And, and moisture levels, they um, help you with um, safe storage um, so the grain doesn't start sprouting. But, but at the other end, if it's overly dry, have you ever found that, Adam? Yeah. So we use it for how long it... So moisture level for, um, we use for, for milling how long we mill for. Um, we find with really hard um, wheat, uh, it's a challenge to, to mill. Um, I've had the opportunity to mill in um, Europe uh, a little bit. Um, our grain seems to be a lot harder and on our stone mills, really hard grain is a nightmare. Um, if I know that before we mill, I mill slightly differently. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting point uh, that Adam's making because um, in the conventional um, grain trading system, um, the highest classification is for hard wheat, um, particularly for um, global trading. And that's uh, this is, the milling systems are um, industrial in that case, and um, none of these mills here are industrial size. So um, I guess you could say that each of these mills on this panel are more sensitive to um, grain hardness or softness and um, you can um, amend the grain hardness if it's come from a district that has a hard finish and produces a hard grain and the genetics of that grain produce um, that, that really tough um, alirone brown layer and the um, really glassy proteins, then you, you can temper. Yeah. Um, but I guess that's another step when you're a small scale producer. Yeah, Thomas. Yeah. Well, I, I, I usually don't bother about the hardness. It, all what it does on the stone mill is basically it just grinds the husk finer, okay? It does, you know, you've got to be a little bit slower. We can temper it, you know, we did try tempering in some years and thought, no, nah, this, you know, the, the branch just comes off in bigger flakes and, you know, it's, it's I mean, we still use it as a whole grain, you know, but. Yeah, it's, yeah, it makes it easier to mill, but yeah. you know, we still use the whole drain. All right, sorry, Ian, you're, you've been, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> these, these panel sessions always could go for another hour, right? And we haven't even got to questions and answers. Anyway, I'd like um, everybody to thank these fantastic millers. <laughs>